sorry for the delay zoom had to reset my password so convenient how uh how secure everything is isn't it all right um let's get started no real updates for today except as you all know or hopefully no homework's due this friday it's the last homework and the project as i mentioned last class is not going to be due until finals week so after the exam i'll, I'll give you the exact date it'll be, it'll be either the wednesday or the friday um, of finals week but there won't be any like you, you can't submit late because then that would be kind of well the class would be over so there won't be any late submissions allowed on that because of that um but i, I am extending it any questions uh and then we'll we'll dive in Okay. Put the video on for you. And share. Okay, so We uh, talked about this example um, last last time about uh, two different threads that are accessing um, memory, and we wanted to ensure that both of the processes saw the same order of the memory operation. So um, our toy example, if you recall, was this code here where we have kind of this flag that is indicating whether or not we've entered the critical section or not um and we identified that even if both processes on both processors are are obeying the von neumann model we can actually end up with uh, them both entering the critical section at once because we have latency in memory. Um, even though it looks to process one that it, a memory operation is complete, uh, process two on the other processor doesn't necessarily have that view. So it'll it'll think that it has the correct value even though it's not. Okay, so here's where we ended uh we were talking about this idea of sequential consistency and we define this as the that there is basically some um some global order and that's what this first clause is saying the result of the ex any execution is the same as if the operations on all the processes were executed in some sequential order. That's just a fancy way of saying we have an order of the memory operations globally across all of the processors. The second part of this definition is that the operations on the individual processor appear in the sequence that is defined by the program. So um, we already saw up here that the memory operations happened in the in the order specified by the process so that that already holds but what didn't hold was that we have some global order and all the processes see the same global order so that's the difference between these uh or that's that that's the new addition on top of what we already had with the von neumann model 
um, oh, okay. So um, this memory ordering model is something that would be specified by an ISA. Um, and this is a fairly strong memory model that, uh, that forces everything to be very, very consistent. Um, we'll see in a, in, in a moment, we don't necessarily need all of this. Um, we could make a decision to not give the programmer as many guarantees, but um, let's just talk about sequential consistency for the time being. And this is kind of what the programmer can expect if there is a, you know, a memory system, a memory model that is sequentially consistent. Effectively, memory behaves as if it's a switch um, that services one memory operation, whether it's a load or a store or whatever, but it, loads, it does one at a time from any processor. So it can't be servicing, for example, a memory request from P2 and P3 at the same time. It could only be doing one at a time. So all the processors then are going to see um, that service load and store at the same time. So P2 requests some memory, the memory gets returned and all the processors are going to see that that, that memory you know, got returned at the same time. Um, and each processor's operations are gonna be serviced in program order. So on each process, as we've come to expect, the memory operations are in order. Just a second. So, Here's a few different orders of those memory operations that we had earlier that would be correct and would be valid global orders. So we could service A and then B and then X and then Y. So again, let's go back to our example up here. Here we have A and B, X and Y. So we could, we could do these two and then these two. We could do A and then X and then B and then Y. We could do A and then X, Y and then B. All of those orderings would be valid as we see down here. And there's, there's even more, right? We could do the X's before the we could do X before A, we could do all sorts of different combinations of interleaving. And the actual order which we observe is going to be dependent on implementation. It's going to be dependent on latencies, um, a lot of different factors. So we don't really have any guarantees about the order, um, except that there is a global order, all the processors we'll see this global order and that within a processor, their operations will be sequential. So those are the only two guarantees we have. Um, this uh, has a few consequences. First of all, um, within a get one given execution, right? We're all seeing the same global order. This allows us to get rid of all of our correctness issues. Correctness issues go away because, well, now we have this order of, of operations. So we won't ever have a situation where two things are thinking that they have the correct data, but they don't. And that's because they all got serviced one after another rather than um, in parallel. And this will this helps with this kind of intuition that we had with a single core processor that if one instruction happens, then another instruction happens, those are going in sequence. Um, and one will happen before the other, right? Uh, now we are able to do that across all of the 
processors. Unfortunately though, because we don't have total guarantees about the order, we still have some variance of which one is going first. And um, uh, you know, there's, there's six different ways to order even just these four operations. Because of that, um, between executions, we might observe, observe different global orders that are all sequentially consistent. Um, you know, maybe one of them just happens to be on slow memory that day or something like that, or the memory controller doesn't prefer that process at that, just because of some, some you know, random number generator. Or it, lots of different factors could be involved here. And that's gonna make debugging pretty annoying still between runs, but at least we never have any correctness issues. So these go away. Okay. Um, yeah, any questions about sequential consistency? Then we'll talk a little bit about whether or not we need all of sequential consistency. Okay, so that's the question. Do is you know this this is a pretty nice abstraction. We get a global order, um, but you know is it too is the requirement too strong? Is it too conservative with these requirements? Um, and and the answer is yes. So by forcing the 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 memory model to be sequential across across all of our cores. We eliminate all of those optimizations that we've talked about with parallel memory accesses. So we can't ever have one processor that is accessing this bank over here and another processor that is accessing a different bank. So we now have to do all those sequentially. That's going to be a massive hit to performance. And we're going to have, we're going to be able to we are going to limit the ability to be aggressive with these memory optimizations um, and other optimizations for that matter. Okay, so is this global order requirement, because that's the real kicker, the, the, the second requirement we already had of it being in order in, on a given processor. So we already have that, but is the global order requirement too strong. This is the one that we have to look at a little bit more. So the first question is, do we need a global order across all of the operations on all of the processors? Um, what if, for example, there are two processes that are accessing memory that is entirely disjoint and they never you know, access the same memory? We aren't ever gonna have any problems with consistency so those operations wouldn't have to be uh, in a global order. They could be serviced in parallel. Um, what about if we do stores, if we have a global order on stores? Because um, that's really the, the issue um, in a sense, right? Up above here where we had uh, our, our example, it was the fact that this store takes a while and isn't going to be finished before we, we do a load. That's the real issue. So if we make stores, you know, if we make those be serviced one at a time and we kind of see that all the way through and we kind of just wait to do any other memory before we continue, that could be, be useful. Um, that is one idea. Um, and this would be this would be what's called the total store order memory model or unique store order model. And then another idea is let's just instead of um, you know having a global order for basically all instructions or all store instructions, how about we only enforce this global order at some boundaries of synchronization? 
Okay, so um, this is kind of, we get into some more relaxed memory models, acquire relief consistency model, which uh, are more versatile in this way. So let's talk a little bit more about some issues that, that uh, arise from that, that second point here, that we are not able to be as aggressive with our performance enhancement techniques. So what performance enhancement techniques are we not able to be as, as aggressive with? Well, one major one is out of order execution. So if we have a global order, but then we do out of order execution, loads are gonna happen out of order with respect to each other and with respect to like their independent um, uh, stores. So, so there's all sorts of problems here. Um, so out of order execution is gonna really get in our way of the sequential consistency idea. Um, And another big one is caching. So with a cache, now you pulled the data into your cache. Maybe you pulled it into your cache in another processor as well. And now you have multiple locations where the memory value exists. So if we do a store on a processor, uh, what will happen is it'll just store on, on the cache, okay? Uh, so we have to do something about that. We have to figure out a way to, to propagate that store across all of the processors um, if, if we use this sequentially consistent model. Okay, questions? Um, okay, so let's let's kind of abandon this sequential consistency idea. There seems to be some pretty annoying uh, hardware implementation things here. We lose a lot of the performance gains that we've we've talked about. So, kind of whenever we we um, have whenever we remove some guarantee from the hardware we put that on the programmer or the compiler or whatever um, to handle that right uh, if for example like with prefetching if we don't implement hardware prefetching maybe you have to try and implement software prefetching stuff like that uh, where now we've taken a problem that used to be a hardware problem we've said oh we don't want to solve this somebody has to still solve this complexity still exists and yay, congratulations if you're a programmer, you get to solve. So with these weaker consistency, uh, memory consistency models, um, the key idea is that the ordering of the operations only really matter for um, certain parts of, of data. They only matter for the shared data. If it's disjoint and you're only accessing a da data from one processor, who cares? That can be done in parallel all you want. Um, but for the shared memory that is shared between the, the different cores, that's when you need this strict stricter ordering. A good example of this is just the kind of uh, idea of maybe you have a, a, a list of work items. You would need any processing on that work item list to be done um, in, a, in a manner that is that is ordered across all of your processors so you don't have two processors pulling your same work item from a queue or something but once they get their work item then they can do all of whatever they want on their own okay so that's the idea um, and, and it's it's put on the programmer now instead of on the hardware to specify the regions where um, memory operations do not and do need to be 
order. Um, the key idea here is that we have these, these things called memory fences. So these are basically instructions that say, uh, delineate between these different regions. Um, everything that happened that is before that fence needs to complete before the fence is executed. Um, and then all memory operations after the fence have to wait for that fence to complete. So we kind of have this um, uh, batch idea as far as memory operations go with our ordering. As long as all the stuff before the fence occurs, um, before the fence is executed on each process, that, and then any memory operations that happen after the fence wait until the fence is done, then we're going to be okay. We kind of have a, a batch of things that go before the fence, a batch of things that go after the fence, and we can have multiple different fences throughout our program that you know kind of delineate more regions of um, execution. And then the other key is that the fences themselves have to complete in program order. So we get, again, we get a, a, a true global ordering on our fences, um, but not on the operations between the fence. And synchronization operations, all of those are basically act as fences. Um, so any of your, any of your, you know, semaphores or, or locks or anything like that. That's that's basically a, a fence. Um, and this is kind of what you are going to see mostly out in the wild. Uh, things more along this line. Because if, as we've seen, total um, sequential consistency is just too much. Okay, so what are some trade-offs with this weak consistency idea? Well, the first advantage is that at a hardware level, we no longer have to guarantee this really, really strict order of memory operations. So that's nice. I like that because, well, I'm not really a hardware engineer, but if I were, I would like that because now I don't have to do as, uh, as much work, I can also introduce more optimizations in the hardware. Um, and yeah, just generally reduce the complexity of our memory handling. And yeah, we as hardware people would like that. The disadvantage is that in actuality, I'm a software engineer, so it's, it's on me to actually figure out the synchronization stuff and deal with the fences and everything. Um, and getting that right is hard. So again, with a lot of our problems, they can be solved at many different places, right? We can solve it at a hardware level. We can solve it at an operating system level. We can solve it at a program level. We can solve it a lot of, you know, there's plenty of places where we can solve these problems. But at the end of the day, they have to be solved somewhere. And if we don't solve it in the hardware, somebody else has to pick up the tab. In most cases, that'll be some programmer doing parallel programming somewhere and having to figure out and debug all of their lock statements. Okay. Um, yeah, any questions? And then we'll move on to cache coherence. So cache coherence, um, we've kind of talked about memory as a whole, but we haven't, we, we, we mentioned, I mentioned cache just briefly. Now we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper because cache is gonna introduce problems even if we just implement this more, um, this, this weaker consistency model, it's still gonna give us uh, some, some annoyances. 
So let's think back to our shared memory model, okay? Um, a lot of times we'll have a parallel program that, that communicates through this shared memory. And I keep coming back to this, but, but at, at the end of the day, every single time that we do an optimization, we still have to preserve the illusion that memory is instant and infinite and is everything's great and everything's super fast. So when a programmer uh, sets a value on one process, the programmer should be able to just assume that that's hit memory, main memory, even though it totally hasn't, it's just in the cache. And then if the programmer goes over to a different process and accesses that same bit of memory, hold on. Okay. I don't know what that was. Somebody was trying to come in. <laughs> Uh, where was I? Oh yeah, so if, if somebody tries on the other process processor to access that same memory, uh, the expectation is that it should look like it's coming from main memory, which just got updated. Okay, so here's an example where we have process zero that writes to memory address A, and then process one prints memory address A later. And we're we're gonna assume that you know there's maybe that um, uh, you know a lot of time that, that elapses between this, for example, um, to make sure that any propagation of that memory is is handled. Um, but the problem is most likely that hasn't ha that memory that propagation of of uh, memory address A into actual RAM hasn't happened because it's a cache. Okay, so the, the, the idea though, the fundamental idea is that we want each, um, oops, each read is going, has to receive the last value written by any process on any processor. So this should, uh, access one, even though this is just living in process zero, processor zero's cache. And that's gonna require synchronization. So we're gonna to have to um, figure out what this last written idea means. And um, yeah, uh, the fundamental problem is that it, it's, it's cached. Memory address A is cached. And so we're gonna have a fun time with that. So let's look at an example of how this might happen. We start out with this value X in main memory. It hasn't been read or written to at all. Um, and then process two loads R2 um, it loads into a register to this, this value X. So we've loaded that um, 1000 into processor two. And these little, these little rectangles are the, the corresponding caches. So P2 has X in cache. Now what happens? What, what, let's say that P1 also accesses this uh, X value and pulls it into cache. So these are both loads. So now we have three uh, versions of X. They're all the same though, right? They're all uh, 1000. Uh, we haven't written any values anywhere, so we're all fine. But what happens if we do something like um, an add? where we um, add uh, 1000 to, to our value, to our, uh, R2, and then put it into R1, and then we store R1 back to X. So now the memory should contain 2000. 
And it does in this cache. So P1's cache says 2000. If P1 goes ahead and accesses our, uh, uh, sorry, if it accesses um, X again, it will receive 2000 because it's in the, in the cache. But the problem is that if P2 does the same thing, it should not load from the cache, right? Because the cache has an incorrect value now. This operation happened before this load. So we've got to figure out a way to either invalidate it, update this, do something, but we can't just leave it as a thousand because that's just wrong. Okay, so this is the problem that we're going to have to solve. So whose responsibility is it to solve? Again, back to, should we make the programmer do it? Should we make the hardware do this? So let's just say that we choose software to do this. Can the programmer ensure coherence of caches, um, ensure coherence if the caches are invisible to software? So that's the, that's the question. Is, is it possible if the programmer has no influence over the cache, is it possible to offload it onto the programmer? Yes, no. No, yeah, it's kind of impossible. If the programmer has no control over the caches, there's no way that the programmer is gonna be able to solve this problem. Now, what if we do give the, the programmer some control over the cache with this cache flush instruction. And we do this on an ISA level, okay? So maybe we have three new instructions, flush local A, which goes ahead and flushes and invalidates this cache block containing address A from the local cache. So we send it back up the memory hierarchy. Maybe we also have a, a flush global A, which does the same thing, but it does it from all other processors' caches. Okay, so, um, and then maybe we also have this flush cache X, which, which flushes and invalidates all cache, all blocks in cache X. So we're, we're just flushing our entire cache, which by the way is a, is a mitigation for um, some like specter type uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Um, it's mainly on on context switches, but so so these instructions do exist in in some ISAs. So yeah, we we need a way to block reads until flush is complete. Let's just you know if. If, if these are guaranteed to complete before read, like if we have some, if we can add some guarantees that flushes will happen and basically block all processors until they're complete, then it would work. But if we don't have a way to block reads until the flush is complete, then we're, we're still screwed, right? We still have problems, even though we're able to force that value out into main memory, out of our cache, we'd still have some problems. So. Um, you know, so let's just say if it is possible, you know, these are blocking operations. We basically stop all processes, do the flush and then continue, you know, what is the disadvantage? Well, the major disadvantage is that that's super expensive. Flushing the cache out to main memory, um, just because we updated a value and we need to then access it from another processor sounds like a really bad time. So um, now let's think about the other side. If we can't do it in software or it's really inefficient to do it in software, let's try to do it in hardware. If we do this job of synchronization in the hardware, um, then well, software's job is easy. And um, we're gonna look at some different ideas of how we can do this, but let's just go with a really simple idea, which is to invalidate all other copies of 
block A when a processor writes to it. So, um, or in this example, uh, block X, right? So we pulled X into here, and whenever we wrote into X, so store X R1, now we should go over here and invalidate it in P2 and P3 and all the other ones. Okay, so that's, that's an idea. So let's look at how we might go about doing this. So here's a very, very simple coherence scheme. The concept is that the caches are gonna snoop on each other. They're gonna like peer into the other caches and see when writes happen to various um, cache blocks, right? And um, because they're looking at all the other caches, when they see a write, that corresponds to some value that they have, they're going to be like, oh, I'll just go ahead and invalidate my cache. Okay. Um, okay, so let's look at this state diagram. And first of all, whenever we look at these sort of state diagrams, I like to start with figuring out what are the states valid and invalid this one's pretty easy so we're going to start at invalid right because th there's nothing here yet um and then we're going to we got to figure out what these edges mean. so this kind of tells us over here we're in a first of all we're in a write through no right allocate cache so all rights are going to go straight into memory so that'll alleviate you know as long as we invalidate it'll be there when we fetch from a different processor. And it's no write allocate. So um, if we write to something and um, we, we aren't going to pull it into the cache. So that's why down here, this PRWR, uh, WR, which is processor write, is gonna keep us in the invalid state. Okay, so I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but the the PR processor read and processor write these are actions on the local processor uh, of the local processor on the cache block. Okay, so processor zero, for example, if we're on processor zero and we do a read from processor zero, we're going to have to look for you know the processor read processor read. Um, we're going to have to look for those edges. So um, the way to read these is that on the left is the action. On the right is the broadcast. If there's no slash, then that's just the, the action that is observed. Um, so actions that are broadcast on the bus for this block are this bus read and bus write. So let's go back up to this picture here. And the idea is that uh, if we do a write in say P1, we'll send a message out on this interconnection network over to all the other processors that says that this block was written to. And that's what it means when we have this bus write uh, action coming, coming through, okay? Does valid invalid bit and page table have any relation to this at all? Not really. So, I mean, valid and invalid is just kind of a, uh, I mean, it's, it's used throughout in caches and different tables, you know, all of your uh, tables are gonna pretty much need a valid bit because it's just an indication of whether or not the data there is, um, up to date or just dummy values, like at the, especially at the beginning of execution, everything is invalid. So not really, in, except for in the sense that, you know, this valid invalid motif is used a lot. Okay, so let's talk about each one of the edges in turn. Um, if we're in the invalid state and we do a write, again, we just stay in invalid state. 
because we're right through or and no right allocate, we aren't going to allocate any block. So we're fine. If we're already invalid and the bus right comes, uh, oh, sorry. Um, if we do a write on our uh, on this block, we're, we also have to broadcast that out across the bus. So even if we're, it's not in our cache, and we just do a, um, uh, uh, you know, the, this write through, we still have to broadcast out on the bus that we've we've written this. If we go back to this example, it would be like. If at this point, P1 did a, a write to X, it just stored some random value into X, it would go ahead and do the write through all the way into main memory. And then it would have to send across the interconnection network that it's written to X. And P2 would invalidate its, its cache. So how does that invalidation actually occur? Well. Um, if we're in the valid state and we see a bus uh, write, then we're just going to move straight to invalid. So now, whatever was there, it's no longer the most recent copy. So we're just going to invalidate it. If we're in the valid state and we do a write, we're going to stay in the valid state because we do have the most up to date copy. But in this case, we also have to send this bus right across the, the interconnection network to tell all the other processors, hey, invalidate your cache. Um, if we just do a read, then we're fine. We just stay in the same place. We don't have to broadcast anything across the bus. And then if we're in, if we're in an invalid state and we do a read, we do have to broadcast a bus read across the bus. We aren't gonna, we aren't gonna use this yet yet. Um, we will in some more complicated schemes, but for this scheme, this bus read isn't actually handled by any of the other processors. Okay, so here's a question. Can multiple processors be in the valid state at once? Yeah. If they're only reading, yes. Yeah. So if we have one processor, it was invalid, then it does a read. Now it's in the valid state. And over on some other processor, we also just do a read. They can be both in the valid state. And because there's no edge that, that there's nothing that happens when we do this uh, bus read, we're fine. We aren't going to move from the valid state. Now, um, if one of the processors does it right, then we're going to have problems again, right? One of them is going to stay valid. The other one has to go across this edge to the invalid state. OK, any questions on this? So that's, that's an idea um, at a hardware level. Let's talk about some things that just won't work. So let's just say that we, we just decide this is too much work. We're lazy. Let's not implement any hardware-based coherence. What's, what are the problems here? Well, um, keeping the caches consistent is going to be the software's responsibility, which we've already seen. Uh, how do we ensure no one reads the data before the write comes through? Was that in re reference to this slide here? 
so yeah okay so so no worries i i guess may, maybe i should reiterate this so the cast coherence and sort of our memory ordering are two separate but related concepts um it's not going to really you, you cash coherence isn't going to help you with situations where you have a race condition to to write or read from a given memory location that's the responsibility of the programmer to you know correctly implement these these senses in the program but even if the programmer implements these fences correctly, because of the presence of the cache, we have to make sure that the cache values are all up to date. So like in this example here, you know, either th this dotted line is maybe a fence or maybe it's just a bunch of time, you know, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's that's the key, right? The the memory order helps us with defining critical sections, saying like one processor can be in the, inside of this at a time, whereas cache coherence is going to help you say, okay, we now have guaranteed that we're only have one processor in here at once. Let's make sure that the values are like up to date when we do loads and stores. Great question, by the way. Yeah, sorry for not uh, maybe explaining that as well as I could have. Okay, more animations. Um, so the obvious disadvantage to not having this in hardware is that it's the software's responsibility and the micro architect has a, has a, is the only one that's happy in the situation. Question, yeah? I was gonna ask about the uh, critical section. Are they specifically only when there's IO, or is it specifically IO that might cause a race? Mm. So the question was are critical sections just any IO, or is it just specific like memory operations? So it's, it's really up to the programmer to decide what's a critical section. Um, it isn't just any given memory IO or anything like that, because uh, with an example of two just totally disjoint processes that are accessing different memory, like who cares? Like there's no, there's no worries about shared memory that could be updated at, at any time and affect the behavior of either program. So in that case, right, that IO wouldn't, be part of the critical section kind of the, the classic example is a shared queue or some shared data structure between different processes um kind of a more software engineering idea would be kind of your your tables in a database right if you lock a table in a database you don't want processes on your you know um, SQL database server to be accessing it then. Um, and so th that that still requires a little bit of hardware lock, uh, locking to make sure that that shared data structure that is defining whether or not a table is locked is, is an access to, uh, at, by multiple processors at once. Okay, so why don't we, so Back to back to the why we don't um, make the software do this, you know. Uh, another big reason is this: just um, you know, this programmer, poor programmers, have going to have to deal with it. And I, I don't know about you, but I I don't ever want to have to write cache coherence in software. And also, even if we do allow them to do this through you know cache flush operations and such you know as a programmer i'm probably going to be just really lazy 
and just always flush whenever I have any thought of potentially needing to just share. And that's going to be inefficient. Um, so also, I'm going to, you know, we're going to see in, a, in a, just a couple minutes here that with cache coherence, you can actually share things across from cache to cache. So that's going to be really, really hard to do in software. Um, so here's another solution that isn't a solution. And that's that all caches are shared between all processors. Okay, so we just let's just, you know, this is really annoying. Why do we have these separate caches? Let's just make it one big cache. Well, the advantage obviously is this entire lecture, half of the lecture goes away. We don't have to worry about coherence, but it's kind of a problem, right? Because if it is shared, then we're gonna have some bandwidth issues. We're gonna have to tons of bottlenecks on our cache, which is supposed to be fast, right? We, we want it to be fast, but if it's not, um if it's our bottleneck then then that's kind of terrible um and yeah we're we're gonna have a terrible time if we want to have a scalable system with low latency cache for all of the processors you know if you look at a diagram of a processor the cache is like part of the processor basically the, at least the l1 cache um it's like right there next to the the part of the core that's actually doing computation so if you like move that even just a little bit away now it's just going to be slow so uh, and and we've already seen that we need our caches to be really fast because amdahl's law and everything okay So how do we maintain coherence? We, we've already kind of seen one idea of this um, sort of message passing saying whether or not to invalidate a, a, a line. Um, but let's take a step back and think about the, the core of what we need to do here. We need to guarantee that all the processors are seeing a consistent value for the same memory location, okay? That's the fundamental problem that we have to solve. So if we write to location A on P0, um, that update should be seen by P1 eventually. And also, all of these writes have to be in, in order. So there's two things that we really need to provide for this to happen. The first is that we have to propagate writes. This is write propagation. Effectively, we just have to guarantee somehow that these updates will propagate to other caches. Okay, that's the first thing that we need to provide. The second thing that we need to provide is serialization. So that is this order thing. We have to provide a consistent global order um, to all of the processors. And this requires that we have some global point for doing the actual serialization. Um, and this is, this is going to be uh, the challenge. There's a few different ways of, of storing this, this data. So um, the basic idea for implementing this in hardware, uh, we're going to have this broadcast. Um, we, we already saw in the, in the simple example that we broadcast when we're reading and when we're writing. Um, and the, the processor or the cache, they're, they're kind of one and the same. For, for the purposes of cache coherence. 
it's going to broadcast this update, this write um, to a memory location and tell all the other processors about it. And then the processors on the other hand are on the other end are going to have an option, whether or not they update or invalidate their local copies. Or if they don't have a copy, they do nothing, right? So let's talk about this, this option. Should we either should we update or should we just invalidate? The first option update is just where we say basically when we um, do a bus write, we'll send the data that's written as well. So we'll push that update to all the different copies on all the different caches. Okay. The invalidate protocol, which we've seen a taste of already, is where um, if we do a write, we just tell all the other processors, hey, invalidate this cache block. Don't worry about updating it. Um, and this allows us to just update our, our current copy over and over and over again, because we're the only copy that is kind of correct at that point. OK, so in both of these cases, read is the same. It's only write that's different. So let's just clarify what happens on read, and then we'll talk about what happens on write. So on read, in either of these cases, if the local copy is invalid, we are going to request it. Um, if another node or another processor has a value, it'll just return it. Otherwise, we'll actually go out to main memory and fetch it. Okay, so we'll go back up, sorry, up to here. Um, when P run one requested R2, it could just have copied it over from C2. So that's what it's saying on, on, on read. If another node has it, we'll just go ahead and, and copy this value over to P1 via the interconnection network rather than going out to memory, which is going to be slow. OK, so that's the easy part. Reads are always easier than writes. So let's talk about what happens on write. Um, now we're going to go back to thinking about a uh, write allocate cache. So the first, the first part is to pull the block into the cache. Again, this can be done um, either from a different processor or from main memory. And here's where the difference between the update protocol and the invalidate protocol really becomes evident. So in the update protocol, what we're going to do is we're, we are going to write to the block. So we just write to the, the cache. And then we simultaneously broadcast that data that we just wrote to, um, uh, oh, and the address that we wrote to. So we were both the data and the address to all of the, the processors that are sharing this uh, cache line. And then all the other nodes, all the other processors, all the other caches, we're going to use all those terms basically interchangeably in terms of coherence. Um, all of the other ones are going to update the data in their in their caches if they have that block. Okay, so I'll go back up to our pretty picture. When this write happens, that two thousand, you know, is what gets written into X, and it's going to send out across the interconnection network. Hey, I updated X. Its value is now two thousand. And our processor two over here will take that information, say, oh, I have X in my cache. And then it'll update it with this 2000 that was sent over the bus as well. So that's the update protocol. What about the invalidate protocol? Um, the first part is still the same. We, we write to the block, but, uh, our broadcast only broadcasts the invalidation of the address. So we only send the address. We don't send the actual data. 
we only send the address um, of the invalidation to the processors that are sharing this value. All the other nodes then invalidate that block in their caches if it's present and call it a day. So I'll go back up again. That's what kind of this one is um, uh, here, right? We could um, we could just invalidate this this one, say that it's it's now no longer in the cache. Question, yeah. So in this example, we're invalidating not actually sending the data. If T two needed to use it, it wouldn't be able to use uh, it wouldn't be able to use that block. Right. If P two wanted to use X, it wouldn't be able to access it from its own cache. But it would be able to access it from its own cache. Yeah, it would do the, it would it would have to request that X and then once it hits the interconnection network, then P1 could service it, for example. Yeah. Other questions? Good questions. Scroll back down so you can see this. Oops, went a little too far. Okay, so which one do we want? Um, the one that we want is going to be determined by write frequency and the behavior that the nature of the sharing um, that we observe. So let's first talk about update. What are the advantages? Well, the, 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 um, the big advantage is that if the set of processors that are sharing the data is constant and our updates are infrequent, so we only update every, you know, few thousand cycles or something like this. Um, using the update is going to avoid the cost of invalidate and reacquire. So what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, the data that we need to update um, it has already been passed across the bus. So we maintain valid copies and all of our sharers all of them have correct up-to-date information and they don't have to invalidate and then have a cache miss and then have to go back out to the interconnection network anymore. Now, the problem is that um, if data is rewritten without intervening reads by other cores, then those updates are useless. So let's think about what this means. Say we have processor zero, which does a write to X and it updates it to 2000. And then it does a write to X again and it updates to 3000. And then finally processor two is going to load X and read that, that uh, 3000. But if we use the update protocol, we actually had uh, two writes in, in, our, in our P2 cache. We wrote the updated 2000 value and the updated 3000 value. So that updated 2000 value didn't actually really help us. It was just wasted latency, wasted time. That, you know, now we have to just deal with it. Um, also, uh, this is kind of, this is basically a write through because we have to send the data that we write into our interconnection network. At that point, we almost might as well send it to memory. But in the end, like the bus still is our bottleneck. That interconnection network that we 
I keep coming back to, this is going to be our bottleneck. When we update 2000 and send it across the bus to say, hey, P2 update, that's going to still cause some, some bandwidth issues for us. OK, so that's, that's the advantages and disadvantages of uh, update. Let's talk about invalidate. So one nice thing about invalidate uh, is that after we send a broadcast saying invalidate all of your caches, then that core is going to have exclusive rights to that cache line. So it can just keep writing over and over and over again to that line. Um, and you know, even though it's sending out invalidation, they won't do anything. None of the other processors have to handle it. And we're actually gonna, gonna see that we're gonna develop a, a, a more complicated state machine that will that will actually prevent us from even having to send any um, invalidations across the bus in this exclusive case. But we'll talk about that next lecture. Um, and then only cores that keep reading after each write are going to retain a copy. So um, because we invalidated, you have to then do a read to be able to get the data again. So only processors that actually need it are going to be like, oh, shoot, I need to go fetch it again. And it'll pull it into its cache. Um, however, the disadvantage is if we have a bunch of write contention. If we have two processors that are trying to write to the same value over and over and over, um, then we're going to have some. We have a lot of contention, and we're going to like lead to some ping ponging of these um, invalidate require reacquire messages going back and forth over and over and over again. Again, you know. If the programmer's fine with this race condition, that's that's perfectly fine. But um, you know, it, it's still going to be slow, right? Okay. Any questions on update versus invalidate? OK, so let's talk about these two different methods for cache coherence. The first, um, and these, these are the reason that we need these methods is to be able to ensure that we actually update the necessary caches. Um, there's two main ideas. The first one is a Snoopy bus, which we've kind of already talked about, where each of the processors observe the others and see what writes and reads they do. Um, and then directory, this is the other one. And this is kind of, we, we have this single point of serialization per block. And then um, processors are going to explicitly request blocks. Um, and we have this directory structure which keeps track of which caches have each block. And then that'll also coordinate which caches need to do invalidations and updates. Snoopy buses are the more common one, but we'll talk a little bit about directories at the, at the end. Um, OK, so let's formally talk about the Snoopy cache real quick, and then we'll, we'll go for the day. Again, all of our caches are going to watch all of the other caches as they do read and write. And then they have to do either an invalidate or an update, depending on which one we chose, um, to make that cache block coherent. Um, this requires that we're going to have metadata associated with each of our cache blocks, right? So we already have our tag, our um, valid bits, stuff like that. Now we're going to have some coherence metadata associated with each 
of our cache lines in the cache. Um, and this is a pretty good method if all of our caches have this common bus. We've already seen a couple of times that interconnection networks, that's our common bus. And that makes implementing this pretty reasonable. Um, unfortunately, it also makes a bottleneck. So we're going to have to figure out a way to handle that. OK, um, that's it for today. Any last minute questions? Okay, I will see you for the last lecture on Monday and then we'll review next Wednesday and then test next Friday.